intelligence at robot bot center for cyber critical system iit today's talk is by dr rahul deepal and he is speaking on post evolution distributed learning rahul deepal is a senior researcher and lecturer at the technical university of munich doing a habitation he received a diploma in computer and communication engineering from the lebanese university in 2013 and has degree from the doctoral school in lebanese university in 2014 Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Then uh, I plan some things to say now. On... Yeah, I think you need. Sure. Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, like you heard in my bio, I focus my research focuses on coding theory, uh, more on privacy and security. And now I'm also looking at uh, mixing coding theory and the properties of machine learning algorithm to get cost-efficient distributed learning algorithms. What do I mean by that? I'll explain to you in today's talk. Okay. Uh, now this uh, talk is a collection of works that are in collaboration with those amazing people. Uh, professor Antonia Vachterze is the professor with whom I work at the TUM. She's basically my employer. Uh, professor Dennis Gunduz, he's at uh, Imperial College London. He's a professor, we have collaboration with him. Max Egger is a superstar PhD student. Uh, he's one of three PhD students I'm co-supervising co with Professor Antonio. And uh, many thanks go to him for helping with the slides. So he drafted most of them. Professor Parimal Parag, do I need to introduce him? Uh, I started my collaboration with Parimal back in, um, in the US through my PhD advisor and it continued. And most of the works are uh, thanks to him. Salim, my uh, Professor Salim Al-Ruwayhib, my PhD advisor, he's at Rutgers. Uh, Serge Kashanna, he was also a PhD student of Salim, and he also did a uh, postdoc at TUM, and now he's at Alto with Camila Hollanti doing a postdoc. And Venkat Dasari, who's a research researcher at the Army, uh, US Army Research Lab. So all many thanks go to those amazing people. Now, let us get started. Uh, the talk has so many sections, for sure. but. In brief, what do, what, what do I want? I want to convince you that we need to uh, worry about efficiency in distributed learning. Of course, I'll define what it is and what are the applications. Then I'll go to the main computation that I target, which is that of a gradient descent. So this section here is actually four sections. First, I define gradient descent, then how to distribute it, then stochastic gradient descent, then how to distribute that guy. And then I pr I'll propose two methods uh, that are efficient. One of them is communication efficient, and the other is cost efficient. It's communication plus computation efficient. Okay, and then I'm going to compare them and conclude. Uh, let me take a, a break here and tell you this talk. May, maybe the slide will not suggest this, but it's interactive. Feel free to unmute yourself if you're on Zoom and ask. You guys here, feel free to interrupt me and ask. I'm more than happy to interact. Okay, and if you're here for math, I'm sorry, I'll disappoint you. Uh, this is more in a high level talk. I'll tell you what the crux is, what, what is the underlying math that's happening, but there will be no proofs. Okay, it's basically just to introduce the topic to you and um, explain to you what I mean by mixing coding theory and the properties of machine learning. And here there's no coding theory. There's only properties of machine learning, but to introduce coding theory is a step forward. So let's start. Distributed computing, it's everywhere. Whether it's on your computer, whether it's on your phone, parallel processes, whether it's cloud computing, edge computing, federated learning, uh, outsourcing to the cloud, you name it, it's everywhere. Now, of course, like any other application, it has some challenges that we need to overcome. Now to talk about the challenges, I'm going to abstract those applications into one nice setting that we can play around with. That setting is known as the master worker setting or to be more politically correct, is the main node worker setting. So if I say master, please do understand that I need, I mean this guy, but it's the main node. And then this setting, there is a main node. 
that has a bunch of data, tremendous amount of data, and wants to run a learning algorithm on this data. Now, it may be the case that this data is too much to fit in one memory, or it may be the case that it's easier to offload the computation. I'm going to assume that there is a bunch of workers, n of them actually, so always n in this talk is the number of workers available to the main node. That main node is going to offload the data to those workers and ask them to compute smaller computations in parallel, thus speeding up the system. I'll be focusing on this setting, but if you're familiar with literature or if you look at the literature, you will see more settings. The most famous ones are those two, the secure multi-party computation and the federated learning. Now, those are very similar. They have a bunch of clients or users. Each one of those users has their own data and they want to collect collaboratively run a learning algorithm or some computation on all the data while maintaining privacy of the data. So main difference between those two settings is that here the data is owned by one entity and we can play around with it and distribute the computations. Here the data is owned by several entities. And in this particular setting, you can compute any computation you want. In this one, the focus is more on learning. And there is a federator here. Let me move this. Okay, no, not what I want to do. Uh, and there's a federator here that can help those users uh, run the computation. All right. So what are the challenges of the uh, main node worker setting? There are many, okay? But the main ones are first the, that of stragglers. Stragglers is the word you're going to hear very often. It refers to slow or unresponsive workers. But then you may ask yourself, so is there a problem? That what's the probability of one worker being slow? But if there is someone who knows uh, the impact of law of large of the law of large numbers. It's you guys, right? You live in a country with 130 crores of uh, people. Like if something can go bad, it will go bad. And if you if you scale up distributed learning, if one worker can be slow with probably one percent, then at least one worker is going to be slow with probably like 60 percent. So it's a problem that we need to take care of. And this is going to be one of the things that I focus on. The other problem is what if you have a bunch of workers. Uh, some of them are slow, some of them are fast, and that can change through time. So we call this heterogeneity and time varying. The other problem is that of privacy. The main node is distributing data to the workers. So if this data is private, then good luck, right? Can we take care of that? And one more problem is security. So what if some of those workers are malicious? They uh, try to deliberately corrupt the computation. Is there something we can do? Now, this slide here is more of a like a zoom out picture. So those are the main challenges that I myself am interested in and many works in distributed computing are focusing in. But for this particular talk, I'm, I'm not going to solve all of them, I'm just going to focus on two of them. That is that of the stragglers. And I'm going to look at a time invariant system, not time variant, in which the, uh, the workers are heterogeneous. So some are faster than others. And I would like to distribute computations kind of to the fastest workers more often. Okay, and the main computation that I'm after is distributed gradient descent. So far, so good. Okay. So the main computation is distributed gradient descent. What is it? Where is it used? Distributed gradient descent is the main underlying computation of all those algorithms, whether ML, artificial intelligence, neural network, you name it. The, the main model is the following. You have the data uh, represented by a matrix uh, of dimensions M times L. And you have a vector, this y is a vector. So I was too lazy to make it thin, but it should be thin, it's a vector. Uh, and it's a vector of labels. So each vector in this matrix A has a label y, okay? And your goal, of the goal of the machine learning algorithm is to find a certain, what I call model or vector w that is used to predict the label yi of a vector ai. So there will be a certain function f of ai w that will return y hat i is what is an estimate of the label, right? And my goal is to find a model W that fits this whole data. So in more mathematical words, I will define a certain loss function, a certain distance between the true label YI and the estimate label Y hat I. And I would like to find a model W star that minimize, you know, the loss at each of those data samples. That's the goal. And gradient descent is a way to solve this. So for example, if you just think of, uh, to, to try to understand this one, if you think of the L2 loss function, what is this saying? This is saying I have a bunch of data and I want to fit them on, on a line, right? So basically I'm just finding the coefficients of that line by solving this one. And now I need to use gradient descent. So what is gradient descent? 
it will tell me look instead in loss uh, in the l2 loss function you can simply revert right it's a linear uh, system of linear equations you can revert but if it's more involved than that then gradient descent tells me the following pick w0 that is a random vector and now compute the gradient of the loss function at that vector w and all the ai yi and take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient okay that's what gradient descent is doing and that's called one iteration and in every iteration you need to update your model so the the update rule is wt plus one equal the old model minus some scaled version eta t is a learning rate as a parameter of the system and m is total number of data so scaled version of uh, the gradient and if you do it many many times this is what what you will be doing if you look at the number of iterations that you run the algorithm this error here, I just say error, but it's actually the difference. Uh, here is L2 loss, by the way. So I do know what is the optimal solution. So I'm comparing my WT to W star. And you see that the distance between them is going to decrease until it hits a very small value. So that's what's basically doing. So every time you just compute the gradient of the loss function and you go a step downhill and then you do it. Problem is, at each iteration, I'm computing M of those sums. And this is a computational bottleneck. Now, is there a way to get rid of this bottleneck? Sure. Did you want to think of something? Thank you. That's going to come, come next. Uh, so what uh, Ankit, right? Yeah, what, what Ankit suggested is randomly pick a subset of this data and then run the algorithm. Yes, you spoiled something to me, but we'll talk about this later. OK, we, this is something we can do. Is there, if I insist, on computing all of those at every iteration, is there is there something I can do? Yeah, exactly. Split it among the n workers. Now I cheat. I have n workers. I split my data because look, this is some separately uh, additively separable function. I'm just summing up a bunch of losses, right? So I I have the data, and I'm the main node. I'm interested in this computation. I hire some workers. Let's just take an example. I hire three workers. I split my data into three sets give one subset to each of the workers and now ask them, you know, I send them WT to the workers and now ask them, you know, each one of you guys compute the gradient of the loss function at your data and WT and send me back the result. And all I have to do as a main node, I have just to aggregate the results of the workers and I'm done. So I distribute the, the computation, parallelize the problem. It's good, it's fast. But if I do this, the main node is as slow as the slowest worker. So for example, if this guy is slow, the main node is going to have to wait for this guy to return the computation and compute. Now, there are two solutions to this problem. And I'm going to first look at the solution of coding theorists. Coding theorists looked at this problem and said, hey, this slow node looks like an erasure to me. Then if I add redundancy, I can fight that erasure. And that's what they did. They said, OK, let me just add redundancy. I keep the same example. The data set is X. I split it into three sub data sets, one, two, three. And now I give each worker two data sets in a certain manner, right? So just here is the circular shift. Now, what do I do? The main node sends the WT to the workers and asks them to compute a linear combination of the gradient. So this G of XI here is nothing but the gradient of the loss function at the data set X1 and WT that is sent. So GXI plus 2GX, the GX1 plus 2GX2 is nothing but the gradient here plus two times the gradient of this loss function. And by computing a, a predetermined linear function, is there a question? Okay. And by, by computing a predetermined linear uh, combination of the gradients, then now if one of the workers is a straggler, the main node doesn't really care. Just look at those two. So you have, uh, if you take, uh, what do I want to do here? Yes. Take this one, gx1 plus 2gx2 minus one half of this one, and you get gx1 plus gx2 plus gx3, right? And you can repeat the same computation. So if you, if there's, and yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parimal. That's my main point, my next point. The, I am speeding up. So Parimal said, yes, yes, you tolerate a straggler. Amazing. But hey, instead of computing one computation, each work is computing two gradients. And again, it's, it's uh, computationally expensive, right? So thank you, Parimal. I'm going to come to that point in, in two bullets. Yes? Uh, 
So it looks like what problem? Sorry, I'm not familiar with that. So you have some basic amount of resources. So yes. You can forget about that. Then you choose, like, you have some elements in the Okay, maybe let, let me let me tell you one thing that maybe in because I'm not familiar with the problem that you're saying, but it, to my to the extent of my understanding, you know the resources right in your problem. In my problem, I don't know which one is fast, which one is slow, and I don't know which one is going to be slow. And this is an iterative process. So every time I repeat the iteration, things are going to go crazy again. So I cannot pre-allocate tasks. I want something to work, whoever the stragglers are. So it could be in this example that in iteration one, this one is the straggler. It could be in iteration two that this one is a straggler. And I still want to be able to fight this one, right? So that's why it's interesting to, uh, to do a great, this uh, framework is called gradient coding and it started by Tandem Dimakis and Karam Patsiakis. Uh, simply it's called gradient coding because look, the coding is over the gradients and not over data. Data is replicated, right? Okay, very well. Uh, so now what happens, we can tolerate the straggler and there are lots of interesting works on this. So, okay, how can I maybe make this more interesting, uh, reduce communication efficiency, uh, you name it. But then like Pariman said, sure, I tolerate stragglers, but I ask them to compute more. So the natural question is, is there a way to tolerate stragglers without adding extra redundancy? The answer is of course, yes, but before we answer it, let's take a step back and go to what Ankit said. I'm going to, to go to what people call stochastic gradient descent. So what I, when I asked you first, can I reduce the computation bottleneck? Ankit said, okay, subset, uh, sample a subset of those points and run the gradient computation on them. That's what people do in machine learning. So in centralized setting, if you want to speed things up, you stochastically sample some of the data points or data vectors and you run the gradient algorithm on them. In fact, you can sample as less as just one data. point. So one data sample, and you run the uh, the gradient update on GI on that data. So this is the gradient of the loss function on that data sample and WT, and you run it. But there, there is a caveat. If you look at the um, uh, sorry at the evolution of the error as function of iteration, it's not as fast as gradient descent. So this is how fast it is as function of iteration, gradient descent, and it reaches a certain quote unquote error floor. There is some W bar that uh, this algorithm will reach and it'll not be able to improve upon. So if you're happy with this performance, which is okay, right? You don't want to overfit the data. If you're happy with this performance, then you could do stochastic gradient descent. So when does this work? There are two things that you need to worry about. And the first one is that the estimator has to be unbiased, which means that overall iteration, the average of what we compute here, the average of those GIs is going to be the true gradient which we can, we can handle if you sample those data points uniformly at random, then simply the average of GI is this guy, is this guy. And the next thing you need to worry about is the variance of the estimator. So first you look at the first order, the average, and then the variance. If the variance is large, then your convergence is slow. If, it's, if the variance is smaller, then the convergence is fast. Now, and you could look at the step size. So this also plays a, a very interesting role in the convergence analysis. But um, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to take this to be a constant and not worry about all the sorcery that's happening. Yes, Parima. So, what is this error flow if you target the error flow for the error flow Yeah, yeah, it can be very bad. You want to understand how bad is this? Yeah, what is the error flow signified? Look. Um, I will not be able to answer you right now directly. Because my understanding here is this error floor is going to depend right on the variance of this guy. So, yes, yes, but also, to the, no, yeah, yeah, let, let's talk about this. Sure, sure. So, in, if you make some assumptions, okay, then I will, I'll talk about this mathematically, what kind of handle you can get on the error floor. Like, 
how bad is this error floor based on how many data uh, samples you get at each duration and so on. Sure. Okay, and let's let's take this offline, then we can uh, brainstorm more. Sorry, I just need to uh, drink water. <clears throat> Sorry, and it's not only the speed, it's also the error flow that depends on the variance. So one way to reduce this variance is the following, pick more than one data point. So this is known as batch SGD, but I'm gonna call it SGD for this talk. Batch SGD is it reduces the variance of the estimator by sampling more than just one node each direction. Now, having this in mind, let us revisit the straggler tolerance in distributed gradient descent. Some people said, sure, I can the main node can compute an estimate of the gradient, and then all I need to care about is the quality of that estimate, which means I can assign little redundancy, not as much. Uh, as much, I mean, if you want gradient coding to work, there is a fundamental limit. If you want to tolerate S stragglers, each data sample has to exist at S plus one uh, workers, right? So there is an S plus one, what we call redundancy factor. And now if you have SGD, stochastic grain descent in mind, then you can reduce this redundancy from S plus one to something less and just compute an estimate of the gradient. But for the sake of this talk and to satisfy Parimal, I'm going to work look at another setting. What if I don't want any redundancy, zero? So each data sample exists at one worker. What can I do? Empirically, those researchers from Google, Chen Pan, Monga, Bengio, and Josefovic, uh, they looked at uh, this setting and they ran uh, some uh, machine learning algorithms. They hired uh, 100 workers. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, they measured the convergence, the time it takes for the system to converge. So they, they measured for if, you, if we wait for 50 workers, 51, blah, 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 until 100. And they noticed some parabola, some curve. So the time, the convergence time, decreases until 96. So if you wait for 96 out of 100 workers, this is the best you can do. Once you start working for uh, waiting for more workers per iteration, then you have the straggler effect again, and the waiting time is going to increase. So they said simply ignore 4% of the workers. So higher 100, uh, ignore 4, and you'll be good. Theoretically, uh, Duta, Joshi, Gosh, Dube, and Nagpurkar analyzed the convergence, I'm going to call it convergence speed. It's not convergence rate, it's the evolution of the error as function of time in distributed learning. The setting is as follows, you give me n workers, the response time of each of those workers is a random variable. I assign those workers computational tasks, and now I wait for k out of n. What is k out of n? Is the k ordered statistics. And having this in mind, now I come and analyze the convergence speed of the algorithm as a function of k. And you can draw those graphs. Yes. Yes. Exactly. You stop everything. So let me just repeat your question. The model is you assign tasks to n workers. You wait until k of them respond. Then, <coughs> sorry, the main node sends a stop message to the workers to stop what they were doing. Start the next iteration. I'm really, really sorry, guys. I caught. Um... Sorry. Sorry. Yes, yes, and also um, travel and so on. I'm not doing that well, but it's fine. No Bombay. <laughs> okay. So, yes. I'm going to cheat on you and assume that upload, meaning from main node to work, to, <coughs> sorry. sorry, the response time is going to include the transmission from main node to worker computation and transmission from worker to main node. Right now, if you want to be more accurate, you would want to split that. You would want one random variable for each and then look at sums of random variables and enjoy, but the analysis gets more interesting. For this talk, it's just all of them one random variable. Okay, uh, should I repeat the questions for the guys on Zoom? Okay, maybe that's a better strategy. So Moon Moon asked, um, so we, I said the response time of the workers is a random variable. Does it include um, communication plus computation? And the answer was yes. So now if you look at the, uh, the evolution of the error as function of time, a very interesting phenomena is going to happen. This setting is, is one of 50 workers. And, um, <coughs> sorry. Each figure here 
is the case order statistic for a different va value of k. So this is the evolution as time. The blue one, if the main node waits for only 10 workers. The orange one for 20, 30, and 40. And while you will see that the error floor is improved if I increase k, you would see that um, the algorithm is fastest for k equal to 10 until it's not increasing anymore. Then it's better to have 20. Then it's better to have 30. Then it's better to have 40, right? So for those guys here, for Dutta et al, they said, you know, just draw those graphs for different case and pick the one that is faster and that's it. That's your struggle tolerance. Do, do you guys think of a next step? Should I just fix K and run the algorithm and live with it? No, Moon Moon is saying no, why? Yes, so, yeah, yeah, until I reach N or something, I'm happy with it. So Moon Moon is saying, you know, if you, if you fix K, fine, it's fine, you can live with it. But it looks from the graph, then maybe start with a small K and gracefully increase it, right? And that's what I'm going to do, yes. Yes, so Ankit is saying, take K, hit the error floor, and then increase. Take K, hit the error floor, increase. Yes, that, that's one, one thing. So that's one thing. I can hit the error floor and then increase. Or there's another thing. What if I only, that, that's what I'm going to do, by the way. But you could also think theoretically that I always want the fastest uh, descent, the steepest descent. So I always want to compare at every time which one is faster and then pick the fastest, right? So my goal in the next part of the talk is to get the envelope, okay? So I would want to pick K that has the fastest speed and what's, once it's not the fastest anymore, I'm gonna increase it. That's what I want to do. And that's a joint work with uh, Serge, Parimal, Venkat and Salim. How am I going to do that? In the first approach, I'm going to say, so that's the joint work with uh, Serge Paribal and uh, Venkat and Salim. I'm going to say, I'm going to assign tasks to all of the workers, right? And wait for K, fastest K, such that this K it optimizes the convergence. And I'm going to call that communication efficient. Why? Because we get to your point. Sorry, can you remind me of your name? Nilesh. Hmm? Nilesh. So we get to, to the point that Nilesh made is that I assign tasks to all the workers and just wait for K of them. So com computation is happening, right, at all the workers, because when, when the main node stops the computation, maybe the workers have done something, but he, he doesn't care about it. But in terms of communication, only K workers are communicating back to the main node. And then I'm going to take one step further and ask, can I assign tasks only to K workers and wait for them? And the main question here is, which workers should I pick, right? I need to know which workers out of those N are the fastest and assign tasks to them. And here I'm going to use the theory of multi-arm bandits to learn the speed of the workers while assigning tasks to them. And that one I'm gonna call cost efficient. It minimizes on communication. It also minimizes on computation because only K workers are computing at every iteration of the way. Which one here or here? No, I only choose K. I don't, I have N workers available. I, I send computation to K of them. Yes, yes, yes. Every time, I'll tell you how I'll do it. So I'll tell you. The question here is, is how do I choose K out of those N? And then on a high level, before I get to the details, the answer to this question is, I'm going to explore and exploit. At, a, at the first step, I'm going to choose one worker and give him task, choose another one, give him task, another one, give him task, until I kind of have an estimate of their speed. and then exploit, choose the ones that I think they are faster until I have a better estimate of the speed and then exploit the workers. And then I'll, I'll do this while also increasing K, right? I have to increase K. So first I start with one workers and then when I need to, I'll sample two and then sample three and so on and so forth. So if there is one message for you to take home from this talk is that instead of using coding, I can simply leverage just the properties of machine learning algorithm, right? To tolerate stragglers, and to even make it more efficient and sample the fast workers by also using multi arm bandit. So that's the, the, the next part is I'm gonna open this up and explain how to do it and what are the guarantees. One of the audience. Yes, yes please go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself. 
Yeah, hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, someone is here. So uh, the 50 workers, you assume they are homogeneous in terms of they, they have the compute capacity, so they are homogeneous or you don't know absolutely what is their compute capacity. And the other question okay. is, uh, uh, the other question is, suppose k equal to 50. So in that case, uh, each node uh, has the same amount of data or like you equally split it uh, into 40 uh, parts or they have like you can, it's not equal. So these are uh, two questions. Okay. okay. Can you please just remove the sounds? Yeah, yeah, yeah very good questions. And I'm going to answer them in more details as we come. So I'm going to repeat the questions for you guys. First question is, um, is the response time homogeneous for the workers? In this setting, yes. In the communication efficient, in the cost efficient, no, it's heterogeneous. It's non-IID. Uh, I'm gonna make it uh, more detailed when I come to it. And the next question, because if it's IID, then it doesn't make sense, right? I'm, everything is uh, random, then just sample NDK, it's gonna be the same. Sure, sure, across time. Sure, sure, so Parimal is saying IID across iterations, yes. The, if you take one worker, the response time of that worker is IID across iteration, for sure. Now, if you look in uh, horizontal, the response time of the workers are independent, but not identically distributed. If they're identically distributed, then this, this is going to work perfectly fine. Okay, and if they're non-IID, then this is better. And the next question is, do I assign the same number of computations? Yes, yes, I do assign the same number of computations. So if I if I sample K workers, I'm going to detail the model when I come to it, but the high level answer is I'm going to assign the same amount of computation. <coughs> Sorry. So what is the model for the communication efficient one? There's a main node, there's a bunch of workers. Uh, the data is partitioned, no redundancy, and sent to the workers ahead of time. Okay, so now each worker has a bunch of the data. And they would compute uh, the gradients and send to the main node. Here's where the uh, Parimal's command comes into play. So Parimal said the worker response time, okay, array ID, sorry, this is what uh, the question comes into play, uh, because I need that the worker response time to be ID here for things to work. The next point is that the worker response times are independent across iteration. Why do I need this? I need this for the math to work. Remember, stochastic gradient descent, I sample data, I, I take data points, data vectors, I sample them uniformly at random every iteration and independently. And for, for the gradient to be unbiased, I need to sample IID every iteration. Since I fixed the data to the workers here, I'm sampling workers, right? So I need to sample workers IID every iteration. So I need this assumption for the conversions to hold. Okay, so that's the setting now for the communication efficient. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to pause for questions, so just interrupt me, okay? Uh, do interrupt me. Usually I pause to, to question, but I see that the audience is interacting. So let's, let's do it this way. Okay. Now let's try to answer Parimal's question. Parimal at one point of life asked, so what is this error flow? How can I understand it? And to answer this question, let's look at the convergence rate of SGD. Rate meaning a function of iteration. Um, this is standard uh, computation. You can take it uh, from the paper by Leon Boutou and co-authors or Dutta et al. And what does it say? Under some mild assumptions of the loss function, convex, smooth, blah, blah, and blah. The expected difference between the current loss function f at iteration j, wj is the model that I have iteration j, and k is the number of workers I wait for, okay? So the expected uh, difference between this one and the optimal loss function, which I don't know, but this is the optimal, it could be zero, right? is bounded from above by this term that I call error floor and this term that I call transient behavior. Now, takeaway message, this is a bunch of constant. Eta for me is a constant, this is the learning rate. L sigma squared and C are constants. So Lipschitz constant of the gradient uh, computation, some constant that I forgot what it is. And this is some uh, convexity con uh, constant. So all those are constant. S is how many data samples I give to each worker. And the only variable here, is k how many workers I wait for, right? So Parimal, here's where, the, where this error floor is as function, if you want, of, of the variance on how many. In the plot I showed you before, I cheated. I did not plot this one. I plot the distance between w and w star because I know them. But in, in a plot next, I'm gonna plot this one. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. The me, uh, sure, sure. This is just average. Yes. Oh. Mm. I'm, oh, okay. Sure. sure. And, and next to this term, so this term is, is, if you look at it, doesn't depend on iteration, nothing, right? It's just a constant that. I increase k, I make it go away. Good. That's what I want you to know from this term. Now, this term, on the other hand, is something that I get by doing uh, recursion. So it's 1 minus x plus c. OK, forget about this. But it's to the power j. j is the in iteration index. So when j goes to infinity, this is a sm number smaller than 1. It's going to go to 0. And this whole term is going to disappear. That's why I call it transient behavior. This one, when I start the algorithm, is going to be high. Right, it's going to be dominant, and as j goes to infinity, is this whole thing is going to go to zero, and all I'm left with is the error flow. Good. Now, if I open up the parentheses, I look at w zero as the loss function when I started. F star is a constant, right? And this is exactly the same guy. So again, constant, 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 but k. I look at it one more time, and and I see that in this equation, it's, it's in my interest to increase k, right? That's it. Done. I'm done. And that's what I showed you before. If if I only look at iteration. Then increase k and and that's it. No, nothing to do. But if you do this analysis as a function of time, and not as a function of iteration, then there will be an interplay. What will happen is the error flow will remain uh, as it is. So this, by the way, the uh, average of this loss function minus f star j of t is number of iterations that happened until time t. I need to assume this is a given entity, and then I can bound the error from above by the same error floor. But now I replace the iteration j with something that depends on k, which is, oh, this is very bad. This is mu k. This is the k, the, the average of the k order statistic of the response time of the workers. So I have here something that's uh, inversely proportional times 1 minus epsilon, for sure, and those are the same. So now what happens? If I increase k, I decrease the error floor, but I, I blow up this one, yes? It's just a constant. I think it's the convexity constant. Yes, 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 yes. So this has to be smaller than one, right? Otherwise, uh, yeah, it has some constraints. Yeah. Mu k, mu is like an average of the kth order statistic of n iid random variables. Thank you very much. Amazing. Yes, thank you. OK, so the questions were, so C is, should satisfy some constraints. For, for this to converge, yes, F plus C should be smaller than 1. And what's mu k is the, k, the average of the kth order statistic. So if you look at the system as a renewal process, then you can analyze the kth order statistic as a function of k. And then you run, instead of the j, you, you see how much time it takes to run each iteration. And then you do recursion. And this is what you get with high probability. Now, OK, this is just math. So let's just look at it in, in, in terms of graphs. What I just told you now, if you plot those things, and this is a system where n is 5, and just iid random variables, exponentially distributed random variables, sorry, with a certain mu mu. Uh, then for k is 1, you, let, you get the orange plot. For k is 2, you get the green one, 3, 4, 5. And what we, what we would like to do is not only reach the transient behavior and then uh, change, but we would like to choose the fastest, right? So first, I choose k is 1. And then I realized that at this time, k is 2 is better. So at this point of time, I want to choose to, to, to switch to k2 and then continue. At this point of time, I want to switch to k3 and continue. And at this point, uh, so this one, 4 and 5. OK, so I want the envelope. So theoretically, I'm going to compute those uh, upper bounds and just compare them and choose the one that has smaller time. That's all I'm going to do. This is so what, what the Ankit is asking. You calculate the error floor at each k, and the, the moment you reach the error floor, then you move. The answer is theoretically you can, but actually heuristically you cannot. So look, those constant you, you know in theory, right? If, if you assume L2 norm and you know the data and everything, then you know the Lipschitz, you know the convex, all those are for theory. But in practice, you have no handle on those numbers. And then I'll come to that. I'll come to that. So keep this in mind, but wait on it, OK? So in theory, this is what I want. And instead of just computing all of them and then uh, comparing, uh, we, we, have, we derived um, 
uh, formula to tell the main node when to switch. And the formula is as follows. At time tk, that is, you, you switch uh, from k to k plus 1 when this is satisfied. OK? So I'm not going to go through the math, but, the math, but this is uh, what it is. So there is um, a theoretical optimal switching time at which the main node should switch from k to k plus 1. Now, this is nice and easy, but it's uh, theoretical. So Anke traced this point. So, okay, maybe it would, how do you do this heuristically? He asked this in different uh, ways. How do you do this heuristically? How do you do this heuristically? And heuristics, what I'm going to do is, instead of just taking uh, which is fastest, I'm going to detect the, the, this phase transition. I'm going to detect when the error floor is hit and then move, okay? So let's look close enough at this uh, behavior of the convergence. In the in, there is two phases, right? Let's call this exponential phase and stationary, stationary phase. In the exponential phase, the transient behavior, behavior is dominant. And uh, usually, the gradient are going to point in the same direction. So the gradient is pointing up, but I always move in the opposite uh, direction of the gradient. So they're pointing in the same direction. So if I'm in the exponential phase, then I should expect that dot product of two gradients uh, is going to be positive. And this, this nothing I created. It's, um, it's by Flug in the 1990s. And there's also many, many works on how to detect this phase, uh, phase change. Now, when I cross to the stationary phase, where the error floor is now dominating, there's a lot of what Parimal was saying. There's a lot of oscillation around this W bar, right? And this oscillation, what does it mean? It means that I expect the, the uh, consecutive gradients to have a negative dot product. So what we're going to do in this work, heuristically, when do we switch? We're going to set a counter. We take this from Flug. We set a counter that is when the dot products are negative, this counter is incremented. When the dot products are positive, we decrement it. Because sometimes this is very nice, right? But sometimes some oscillations happen here. You don't want to switch too early. So that's why you decrement the counter if uh, there is a positive one again. And we set a threshold after which uh, we declare a phase transition. So you can think of a threshold being 100, maybe. And then this counter is incremented. When it reaches 100, we declare error floor is hit, move to the next k. OK, that's what we're going to do. And to uh, in instantiate this in, in simulations, we first created some artificial data that we can handle, uh, because then we can uh, calculate those Lipschitz constant and whatnot. And we, we, uh, we run this uh, logistic regression, L2 uh, loss function. And we, this is the switching time that we obtain. And you can see we kind of have this envelope. So this is just directly. And we also implemented this on MNIST. Everyone likes MNIST. It's a very easy data set, handwritten digits, right? Um, and you do logistic regression. So the theory, all the theory is for convex functions, but I mainly talk about log lo uh, L2 uh, loss. But you can also do this for classification. It's logistic regression. Uh, it's not uh, linear anymore. It's classification. And then we have the same behavior. And here, Parimal, I'm. So in here, I'm showing you the distance between Wj, which I reach at iteration j, and the optimal one. Because here, I can invert the system. I create the data. I know what the optimal loss looks like. Here, I don't know what the optimal, uh, sorry, model. I don't know the model, but I can compute the log loss, the average log loss. You have 10 classes. And for each class, you have a certain loss. And the average as function of time. And you can see that we kind of also get, uh, we, we do actually get the end. So far, so good. Yeah, so that's the first one. Now, the only thing remaining from the first part is what happens to communication. This is what happens to communication. If you look at this linear regression, by communication here, my cost is, is the following. One unit for upload from main node to workers and one unit for download from worker to main node. And because, I, because the main node uploads the data to all the workers or the model, basically, to all the workers, so at every iteration, I have n units going up and I have k going down. So what I'm doing here is I'm summing n plus k when I and vary k. So if you look at the colors, blue is the one that is adaptive, and all the others are fixed k. And you could see that in the beginning, the blue is doing as well as the orange. So you could you could have if so look at this, this is error, and this is communication as function of error. If you're satisfied with error that is of the order 10 to the minus one, then maybe you do you want to do k is 10 and fix it. Right? But if you want error that's of the order 10 to the minus, uh, sorry, something here, 10 to the minus 2, then the best bet is to do the blue. So here is, if you, can, if you consider both upload and download, so it's not always clear which one is optimal. But of course, if you consider only download, because you can say the upload is a broadcast, it's OK, it's cheap. But if the download is more expensive, then you subtract n from all of them, and then it, this becomes the best. And in the MNIST case, it's um, 
it just happened to be the best. So for any error you look and then you take the minimum, it's the blue curve that minimized the down, the, yeah, the communication curve. Okay, uh, more questions on this part? Sorry, please. Yes, uh, this here is uh, give, given a design error, uh, which k converges with the smallest communication cost? Which k converges with error? With, okay, so the question is, uh, what is this graph, right? So given, am I saying given k, which one converges fastest? Or what, I, what am I saying? Here, I'm saying which k, given k, which one converges fastest, right, as a function of time. And here, I'm saying given an error that I fix, which one converges with the smallest communication cost? Because that's communication as function of time. Yes. 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 The same one. Yes. So to repeat what Parimal said, those graphs are the same as those guys. They're exactly the same experiments. That just I ran the numbers on those experiments and plot them. And this guy, I plot time and the x-axis and what error do I reach at every time. Uh, on the y-axis, and on this graph, I plot the error on the x-axis to reach that error. Now, what is the communication cost in the sense that um, how many n plus k I have until this point? n plus k, n being number of workers, and k being that particular k at the iteration. Cumulative until, yes, it's cumulative. Perfect. Good. How are we doing on time? Uh, I still have 10 minutes. Yeah? But I started late. Can I steal five minutes? Okay, so yeah, 10 minutes, fine. So now cost efficient. Now what I'm going to ask, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit faster, but slow me down when you need it, okay? So I'm going to ask the following question. I know from the first part that uh, how many, I need to choose, there is a question, how many workers to use? But now I'm going to look at the multi-arm bandit theory to, uh, to ask which workers to use and combine them to get a cost efficient learning, all right? So what is the multi-arm bandit? So my system is a little bit different now, the setting, than the one before. I'm not going to assign the data beforehand to the workers. I'm going to assume that there's a shared memory with this X and the label and everything. And now the workers have access to the shared memory. Now, thanks to Max, Max drew this uh, nice picture. That's why I'm not using my same uh, boring workers. So, okay, now the shared memory, what happens is that the main node gives um, the model iteration J to some workers, K workers. Those workers will look at the shared memory, sample data IID, all right, so sample data uniformly at random from the memory, compute the gradient, send it to the main node. The main node is going to aggregate and repeat. Okay, so here, the response time of the workers are non-IID. If you look uh, worker to worker, so they, uh, they are some random variable with uh, different means. And by the way, I'm gonna focus on the setting where they are all exponential random variables, but just the mean is different. Mu one, mu two, and mu five. Um, and then I'm going to use multi-arm bandit to determine fastest workers exploration while minimizing the impact of struggle exploitation. So that's what I'm going to do. The independence across uh, iterations. I mm -hmm. no, I do need across workers. Independence. So the question is, you don't need independence across workers. I do need. So this is the re response time of this worker is independent from this one. Independent. Independent. Independent but not identically distributed, yes. And I don't need the assumption of independence across iterations simply because I allow this shared memory process. So now the workers, they sample data independently every iteration and that's it, right? So multi arm bandit model, the name comes from those bandits in the casino. So you have this machine, which has an arm and you pull the arm and it's gonna give you a reward with certain probability. Uh, this is an iterative process, so you have a fixed budget of money, otherwise you pull all machines many, many times and you see which one has the maximum reward, then you use it. But you have fixed budget, then uh, you go and pull each arm, and every time you pull, you, you compute the statistical uh, mean, right? And your goal is to put with as many, as less pulls as possible, but each pull is going to cost you, to estimate the means of all the arms and basically estimate the mean of the best one, right? And then pull the best one. And those are some notations that are, uh, I'll def now we don't, we don't care, we have 10 minutes. So those are some notations. Mu hat is statistical mean, and this one is number of pulls at this time. All you need here is a confidence bound. So for this algorithm, for each arm, you assign a lower confidence bound. How confident I am about the mean of that arm. So it's actually minus infinity if I have not sampled that arm, because I want to sample the one with the minimum LCB, so I want to sample all of them. 
and it is the statistical mean minus some confidence radius uh, is how many how confident I am as function of number of pulls that this is the true mean. Okay, that's all there is to multi arm bandit. But in our setting, we need the combinatorial one. At combinatorial, you can pull multiple arms. I, I can, I'm going to pull K workers, right, and observe their mean. And I need to have an LCB for all those workers and analyze what's going to happen. So I pull, I observe the response time, blah, blah. What's going to happen now? I'm going to group my iterations into rounds. So there, before, in the, in the communication efficient part, I have K, right, and I pull them here. I have many, many iterations. I not only care about iteration, I care about rounds. In every round R, R is K. In every round R, I'm going to pull R workers. OK, and when I need to increase K, I increase R, and I pull R workers. And I still need J to be the index of iteration. And this is just a notation for the arms. Now, I, I will have a policy. What is a policy? A policy phi is simply the, the, this LCB. right? So this LCB is going to determine how good a policy is. And the policy, optimal policy pi star is one that knows which, one, which workers are the fastest and is going to pull the fastest workers. Now, just to, to remind you, this LCB, the lower confidence bound, this is what we design it to be. So this is a joint work with Max, uh, Antonia, and Dennis Gunders, right? So this is the LCB that we choose. And all now we need to care about is the regret, is how bad, how, how much of a hit is, are you going to take uh, to learn the, the uh, speed of the work, right? So that's all you need to care about. Now, if you assume they're exponential, blah, blah. Of course, yeah, yeah, we have a bound. Yeah, that's the upper bound and regret. Now, the takeaway message here is that this regret is logarithmic. So if you take regret divided by j, j being number of iteration, as j goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So this is very good, right? And the analysis is a little bit uh, complicated, but let's not worry about it. So in simulation, that's the regret. Uh, that's the bound we have on the regret. But if you simulate uh, this multi arm bandit thing, then uh, the as number of iteration, that's how the regret looks like. And it's kind of slowly increasing in the end. So this is good. And why why is this happening? Because if you look at, um, you order the workers by their, by their average response time, and you observe empirically each worker, how many times you're pulling that worker, the optimal policy, policy the green one, is going to only pull the fastest ones, right? What, uh, what the multi arm bandit policy, the non-optimal one, is doing, it's first, let's take the, order, the blue one, which is the one I showed you with the LCB, is going to pull all the workers and then starts adjusting. So you would see that the blue one pulls uh, all the workers some number of time, and then it adjusts, and those are pulled more often. The orange one is something that we didn't analyze theoretically. It's again, it's the blue one, but um, the lower confidence bound is scaled with the, with the statistical mean. We scale it, and it gives us a better estimate. So you'd look like the orange, uh, the orange one doesn't pull suboptimal arms very often, and it converges to pulling the optimal ones. OK, that's what it is. And uh, if you want better uh, performance, then we, you switch to a KL-based uh, lower confidence bound. So it's uh, based. So you compute this KL divergence, and then you do it. It, it gives you better guarantees, but it's uh, ex uh, computationally expensive. You need to run this uh, uh, computation every iteration at the main node, right? And this is what the regret looks like, and this is what the policy looks like. Fine. Now, what is the caveat, right? So yes, you have a question. Yeah. Yes, yes, it will. So Moon Moon is asking, OK, now you're estimating the speed of the workers. Is this not going to affect the amount of time you take to converge? The answer is yes, I'm going to answer it right now. So the answer is, so what is the caveat, right? Um, is life nice and happy? I can do this, save on cost and on time? No. I, I can choose to save on one. So there is a trade-off. So what's going to happen is you give me a budget. Let's say you give me 1, 000, uh, 10, 10,000 Indian rupees, and you tell me you can spend 10,000 on computation. Now, whether you want to hire N workers per iteration, and you, you pay per hire, right? So if you hire N workers per iteration, how many iterations can you, can you run? Not so much. But if you hire K workers per iteration, then you can maybe run more iterations, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fix the budget, which is the number of workers per pull for, for, uh, per, per iteration, per round, for number of rounds. Fine, forget about this. And I'm going to look at conversions over time. If you look at the, the communication efficient one, this is what it is. The, this is the uh, evolution of error as a function of time. You see the communication efficient one? This pulls n workers and, and only waits for the fastest k. And here, the order statistic is k out of n. 
But if you do multi-arm bandit, this is going to go to be way worse. Even, even the optimal policy, the green one, is the one that knows which K workers are the fastest and pulls them and doesn't do as well as this one. And the simple reasoning is this is Kth order statistic out of K for every K, whereas this does K out of N, right? So even the optimal policy is worse in terms of time. The takeaway message here is if you fix the budget, I think here is 10 to the six, the, um, the uh, communication efficient one will run until here. And that's it for 10 to the six budget. So 10 to the six number of uses of worker. I forgot what is N and what is time here, but runs until here. Whereas the multi-arm bandit one, it runs until here because it saves on budget because it simply doesn't hire N and ignore most of them, just hires K, right? And also in the, the second message to take is that this KL uh, op uh, policy, the KL based is the best one. This is the optimal and this is the KL. It's not too bad. Whereas this is the blue one. This is the one that I showed you some guarantee, theoretical guarantee. And this is the um, the one with the LCB, not based on KL, but scaled by the statistical mean, right? So this is how they uh, all. Both those are LCB, but this one with with only this one we analyzed theoretically. So there is a f of j that is two log j. This one we did not analyze this pi cr. We did not analyze theoretically, but we scaled this log by mu star by mu hat. Sorry, the statistical mean, right? And this KL is the KL, right? So the blue one is the one that I showed you a theoretical guarantee for. This is with the scaled uh, scaled function, scaled confidence radius, and this is the KL. This is the optimal, and this is the communication efficient. It means that every time, so Parimal asked, I don't understand the budget concept. The budget concept is the following. Every time you assign a computation to a worker, you pay a unit. And if you assign computation to N workers per iteration, you pay N units. It doesn't matter if you if you wait for the fastest K or you wait for all of them. Yes. In the multi arm band approach and the cost efficient, I assign computation to one worker and wait for it. Two workers and wait for two. Three workers and wait for three. That's why I save on budget, like kind of a greedy approach, right? But then I learn the speed of the workers, which allows me to do something better. But it, of course, of course, is budget. If budget is not an issue, then this is the best. Okay. So uh, yeah, we we talked about this. Yes. 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 You can do whatever you want. The analysis I did rounds one, two, three. Yes. Yeah, if you knew. No, but wait. If you knew the K fastest, then the green one is what you're doing. It's the best you can ever do, right? So if you knew, so let me repeat your question and answer you as I, I do. So Parimal said, if you knew the K fastest, then why are you doing, then why is multi-arm bandit doing better than this? No, multi-arm bandit is not doing better than the K fastest. If you know who, which K are fastest, you just sample them, right? But now what is the waiting time? Is the case or the statistic of K random variables. Sure. This is the best you can do in that setting. If you do multi-arm bandit, you do only worse. But if you assign n, so work tasks to n workers and wait for the fastest k, now now you're doing k sort of statistic of n random variables, and that's why you're better. Yeah. But. You're not able to, um, okay, let me repeat. Because your budget yes, so better. So, yeah, yeah, but let, let me let me answer in simple uh, word. If you fix your budget and you assign in every iteration uh, computations to n workers, the number of iterations you run is very small. So in this setting, you will run, just for example, you run 100 iterations. In this setting, you may run 2,000 iterations, right? That's what makes it better, but it's slower. Look, it's way slower because like you said, you assign one computation. No, but it's the same system. How can you do worse? In time, in time, you're going to do worse, but in convergence, you're not going to do because you're computing on the same data. Suppose you 
your business. I don't know what your requirement is. So suppose I'm going to start first, but this is a really, really bad. If I knew the best one, you know, in hundred session they get done. But by searching in two thousand session, I would feel worse because I'm just getting unlucky and finding bad workers, you know, and in two hundred session I'm not getting a job. No, then then your policy is too bad. So here, what you're saying is. Uh, it may be the case that you spend too much time in exploration, right? So you spend too much time in assigning tasks to slow workers and... Okay, okay, Let, let's take this offline. But, but this, is, this is exactly, if I understand your question correctly, this is exactly the trade-off you have between exploration and exploitation. So this, if you look at the confidence radius, uh, it's gonna take some time to load because I use PDF, right? So it's a scaled version of number of pulls, blah, blah. So this is gonna affect how much you, how much time you spend on exploring the, the speed and then when you commit, right? Exploitation is when you commit. But let, let's take this offline, so. Sure, sure, but I'm comparing apple to apple. I do K is the same, right? The value of K. Yeah. So let's now, uh, I just conclude. So what, how much time? Yeah, I'm, I'm already, I, I just need to conclude. So, okay, in conclusion, we talked about this cost efficient learning, only of stragglers and, uh, and some non heterogeneous setting, but non time varying, right? First, we talked about uh, the distributed gradient descent and how to add redundancy and blah, blah, and the stochastic version of it. And then we talked about the communication efficient. So I uh, introduced adaptive case sync SGD and then showed you the optimal switching time then used multi unbanded to get to it. And with that, uh, I come to the end of the talk. Thank you very much. And if we have more time for questions, please go ahead. If you want to know more about my research, that's a QR code for my website. And if you want to talk to me offline, I'm here until Tuesday. Uh, I'm here like next to Pariman's office and that's my email. Thank you. Questions. Okay, then I assume we have no more questions, so. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rabat, for an intimated talk. We can take one, two questions more and close. As discussed before, we would like to remind the audience to subscribe to our Google Groups, which is a mailing list for information on future talks. You can also visit our website for more details. The links have already been pasted in the chat box. The link to the recorded video, video would also be posted on the web page. Thank you and have a good day.